Tonight on Brian Ross Investigates. How could Jeffrey Epstein, the federal prison system's highest profile inmate, end up dead? We are now learning of serious irregularities at this facility. But the investigation of Epstein's sex trafficking operation remains ongoing with new questions about his powerful friends. Then again, Epstein knew a lot of powerful and important people, including Alan Dershowitz, former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, Prince Andrew, as well as President Bill Clinton and President Donald Trump. It is a who's who of who's Jeffrey Epstein. I've never met Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Before Epstein, there was FBI informant Whitey Bulger, murdered in a federal prison in West Virginia. The real conspiracy may be one of incompetence, corruption, and brutality. Plus, our shout-out for the journalist whose investigations sent hundreds of thousands of people to the streets and led to the resignation of a governor. Yeah, definitely. The power of the press and the power of the people. From the Law & Crime Network studios in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and welcome. Tonight, how could one of the country's most high-profile prisoners end up dead in a federal prison cell? It's a question that can be asked about Jeffrey Epstein, the accused sex trafficker with friends in high places. But it can also be asked about Whitey Bulger, the infamous FBI organized crime informant who was murdered in a federal prison in West Virginia in October of last year. So tonight we focus on the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which runs both of those facilities, with these two mysterious deaths putting a harsh spotlight on the BOP, as it's called. Heads have already rolled at the Metropolitan Correction Center in New York where Jeffrey Epstein was being held. The warden transferred, two guards put on leave, and the attorney general promising a full investigation. We are now learning of serious irregularities at this facility that are deeply concerning and demand a thorough investigation. Within hours of Epstein's death, there were wild conspiracy theories about what happened no doubt triggered by the powerful people who had once been Epstein's friends. Then again, Epstein knew a lot of powerful and important people, including Alan Dershowitz, former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, Prince Andrew, as well as President Bill Clinton and President Donald Trump. It is a who's who of who's Jeffrey Epstein. I've never met Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Internet theories claimed Epstein had been murdered to protect his powerful friends, a claim that President Trump included in one of his tweets that reached millions of people. The retweet, which is what it was, the retweet was from somebody that's a uh, very respected conservative pundit. Reports in the New York Times and elsewhere reveal what was more likely a conspiracy of incompetence, overworked, or sleeping guards. Strict protocols regularly ignored. ABC News has learned guards were supposed to check on the alleged sex trafficker every 30 minutes. Sources say that protocol was not followed in the hours before he was discovered. But before Epstein, there was Whitey Bulger, a former FBI informant, murdered at a federal prison in West Virginia within hours of being transferred there, a place where at least five of the inmates were behind bars because of Bulger ratting them out to the FBI. Bulger's eyes were nearly gouged out, and two inmates, including a convicted mafia hitman, were seen on surveillance video entering Bulger's cell Tuesday morning. The FBI also promised a full investigation in the wake of Bulger's murder, but so far no one has been charged and there has been no public explanation of how such a high-profile inmate could end up in the general population of a prison where a number of men had strong motives to kill him. The Bureau of Prisons and its acting director, Hugh Hurwitz, did not respond to our request for an official to appear in our program tonight, which is par for the course with that agency, which over the years has repeatedly acted in a manner suggesting both incompetence and arrogance. There's not been a permanent director there since General Mark Inch abruptly resigned last year, citing matters of conscience. But we're joined now by people who do know a lot about what happens in those federal prisons. Starting here in the studio with Susan Kelman, a New York lawyer who represents a number of clients who've been held in the same facility as Jeffrey Epstein. Also here is Avila Starr, an investigative reporter who's been focusing on the MCC here in New York long before Epstein was found dead in his cell. Also joining us by Skype is Tyrone Covington, the national vice president of the labor union, which represents federal prison guards. And Cameron Lindsay, a former senior official at the Federal Bureau of Prisons who has served as a warden in a number of its facilities, including here in New York. 
Mr. Cameron, let me start with you, and let's deal first with the question of what happened to Jeffrey Epstein. Was it suicide? Was it murder? And whatever it was, how could that happen with a prisoner who had already been put on a suicide watch at least once? Very frankly, I don't know how it happened. It should have never happened. Um, it, it's shocking and disturbing. Um, I believe it was a suicide. The only possible way that it could have been a homicide is if the staff uh, put another inmate inside the jail cell. I've heard the media outlets talk about how there should have been another inmate in the cell with him to serve as like a companion to ensure that he did not kill himself, Epstein, that is. Very frankly, from my perspective, that would be a severe security breach in and of itself. I believe that Epstein should have been single-celled from the very moment that he walked into the door, and he should have stayed that way in, in, until he would have gone out the door. And the reason for that is in the subculture of jails and prisons, it's a badge of honor to be able to take out the likes of Jeffrey Epstein. Here's a guy that uh, it was already convicted pedophile. He's accused of human trafficking, assault on young girls with wide publicity. So he would have made an excellent target in any prison or jail. So he should have never been sold with anybody at any time. Had, if that did happen, I see that as, as, a, as an error, a procedural operational error. Tyrone Covington, let me ask you, two of the guards have been placed on leave. They apparently were sleeping. They may have falsified the logs and lied about it. What's your insight on this? I, I will tell you, I, I believe that we must give our staff the benefit of the doubt here until the um, FBI and OIG completes their investigation. Um, we're not talking about folks, if this did happen in the manner that's being described, who went to work with a pillow and a blanket and said, I'm going to sleep. These were staff who were overworked, overwhelmed in a system that is over, uh, understaffed. Um, and this, this was only a matter of time that something like this would happen. Um, we, we have to get the staffing levels up within the Federal Bureau of Prisons across the system. Aviva Stahl, you've been reporting on what's been going on at the MCC uh, for some time now. Uh, you're not surprised by what happened? No, I'm definitely not surprised. I think for a long time, MCC has had an issue with understaffing and overcrowded, and like other people I mentioned. But also, mental health has been um, a really underserved medical need. I believe that in both MCC and MDC, the sister facility in Brooklyn, there's one psychiatrist to serve the 500 people who are diagnosed with severe mental illness, and then only a handful of therapists to uh, handle everyone who needs any kind of mouth, mental health treatment. From what I understand, people even receive mental health treatment through the slot in their door, and uh, I, it's no wonder that if Jeffrey Epstein was suicidal, that he wasn't getting the treatment he needed. Susan Kelman, as a lawyer, you've been in and out of that facility quite a bit. Uh, are the conditions there as bad as has been described? And if this can happen with a high-profile inmate like Jeffrey Epstein, how about all the others are there? Well, how about all the others? Because the MCC, to describe it as horrific, is really not to say enough. And, you know, you would just, um, Viva was just talking about therapy through the slots. I have young clients, 19, 20-year-olds, who are so in need of mental health treatment, and the court has ordered it on, from time to time, and they describe to me exactly that, that the therapist comes by, how you feeling today? Boom. And before they answer, the slot is closed and they move on to somebody else. These are kids who are reaching out. They need help. I mean, some of them, they've described to me their mothers are 14 years old, and then they have five children by the time they're 19 years old. Those mothers are lost, but their kids are too. And these kids are reaching out. This one young man asked me for books so that he could learn about how to, this is his words, how to find his purpose in life. And every book I sent him was returned. They wouldn't let him get them for no reason. I mean, I, I've gotten to the point where I literally send the books to their chief counsel, who is gracious enough to at least entertain getting the books to my clients. We have a question for you from our control room from executive sure. producer Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda? Sure. Susan, let me ask you, prisoners are always complaining. That's what the public thinks. What do you say to folks who say, you know, that this is a complaint of prisoners? Well, they are always complaining, but they're always complaining because they're treated like dirt under somebody's shoe. And the reality is, I think part of it, in fairness to the institution, if we want to be fair to the institution, 
is it's terribly overcrowded and horrifically understaffed. And when you're an, in, an officer who's doing the job of three people or five people and back-to-back -back shifts, it's not a surprise that you're falling asleep. It's not a surprise that you can't do your job. Nobody could do their job under those circumstances. And then, God forbid, somebody wants to be fed on top of it. And that's really an incursion into their private space. So we know under the Trump administration there was a hiring freeze, which was lifted, put back on, lifted again. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, what's the impact of that kind of action? It's significant, Brian, and, and this has been going on forever. I, I'm not going to attribute it to, to one administration or another. This has been going on forever. Um, my humble perspective is we have got to do something in this country in terms of criminal justice reform. Um, and I'm talking about all components of the so-called criminal justice system. There really is no criminal justice system, but a multitude of systems comprised of local, state, and federal police, courts, and corrections. And frankly, we need to learn how to incarcerate better. We've got to do a better job at that. Uh, prison administrators, uh, from my perspective, I believe, have a, uh, an ethical, moral, and constitutional responsibility to ensure that inmates are, are incarcerated as punishment and not for punishment. So we've got an awful lot of work to do. And the people who are in the MCC in large part are people who are innocent awaiting trial, and yet you reported on them, they're treated in the most brutal manner. Yeah, I think oh, it's important also if, for people who are thinking, oh, well, prisoners complain all the time, to think actually what life in MCC is like. So one thing that I've heard about from prisoners or from detainees, since they're not technically convicted, is that the plumbing breaks all the time. So I read one lawsuit where a prisoner described how the toilet stopped working and they were forced to defecate into bags or defecate in the shower. And then a woman contacted me just a couple of months ago and told me, a woman held at MCC, and she told me that the toilets had overflowed and they were, they were cleaning feces up with their hands and with their clothes. And that's how they were expected to live in this facility. And Tyrone Covington, from the point of view of the union, you represent the guards, you must hear the same sort of complaints about them, overworked, they fall asleep, they're in a situation they can't win and they're understaffed. Absolutely. We hear this all the time. Um, and we have, you know, fort fortunately, uh, Attorney General Barr did come in and lift the hiring f um, freeze that was placed on. And, and I must agree with Lindsay, the, the staffing issues have been going on long. Um, but when you it put a hiring freeze in on top of that, it really becomes problematic. So fortunately, that was able to be done. Those staff who work at MCC, I must say, are um, tremendous people. Um, they, are, they have been placed in a situation um, like this. Um, they choose not to work um, 18 and 20 hours, in some cases 24 hours, uh, believe it or not, um, at, at this, within this institution. They were given this um, circumstances. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, let me ask you this. Is a suicide preventable at a federal prison? Does it have to happen? Because there are lots of them, it seems. Uh, many are preventable, if, if not all. But this one was especially preventable. And I'm just not going to blame this incident on correctional officers. Now, why? I certainly don't condone inattention to duty. If there were officers that were sleeping, I would never condone that. But very frankly, th this this is an issue. The suicide of Jeffrey Epstein is a, is an issue, in in my opinion, of of sound correctional leadership and decision making, or lack thereof. Uh, I'm not trying to badmouth the warden there. I don't know who he or she is. It's a hard job. Uh, I was a warden of five facilities, three prisons, and two jails. It's an arduous, very difficult profession. But honestly, everything that happens inside a federal prison or jail is on the responsibility of the warden, and you have, you have got to be involved in critical decision-making such as this. Jeffrey Epstein should have been left on suicide watch subsequent to his first attempt. That's really the bottom line here. But there's also the issue, I think, in the broader scope here of complaints by prisoners about abuse at the hands of guards, which almost never are confirmed or found in favor of the inmates. They always take the guards' word for it. Maybe that's correct. What do you think, Susan Cohen? Well, you know, there's a process at the MCC and at the MDC where if an inmate has a complaint, they can file a complaint. And before we can ever bring it to the court's attention, the inmate, we have to be able to establish that the inmate filed the complaint and pursued it and there was an action taken and then they can file an appeal and all of this is administrative and bureaucratic. But I have one client, a young man who's there right now, who he's in a special unit 
the door can't be opened unless there's a lieutenant present. But they don't have a lieutenant assigned to his unit. So sometimes he gets his breakfast at 8 in the morning, and sometimes he gets it at 2 in the afternoon. And that's his breakfast. Sometimes he gets lunch, and sometimes he doesn't. But that's because they have nobody assigned to that unit who's allowed to open the door. They are treated so badly, and largely, I think, because they just don't have the staff. I don't know if they do do it differently if they had the staff, but they don't have the staff. And so it, it, there's just no possibility for people to be treated humanely. This also, this kid complains all the time that he never gets to sleep at night. And one of their many abuses is by leaving the lights on 24-7. What is the point of that? They have a switch right outside the cell, so if they want to look inside, they can look inside. And by the way, I've heard many a commentator in the last week talk about how there's no cameras in those cells because that would be an invasion of privacy. Inmates don't have privacy. That's the most nonsensical thing I've heard. Some of those cells have one video camera in them. Some of them have two, and the inmates will cover them just so they can go to the bathroom in private. But there are monitors everywhere. Now, they could all be broken, because everything is broken there. But it seems to me in a place where there's cameras everywhere, there's an answer to what happened to Jeffrey Epstein. We're just not being told what it is. Well, Susan, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our guests today for some fascinating insights tonight. Uh, Cameron Lindsay, Tyrone Covington, and here in the studio, Susan Kelman and Aviva Stahl. Collectively, what you've told us really is nothing less than a disgraceful scandal and the way our federal prisons are being run. Who's guarding the guards? Up next, our shout out for the investigative reporters whose stories triggered massive protests and ultimately the resignation of a governor when we return. And our shout out tonight for a small band of investigative reporters who have had an outsized impact on the officials they've been covering for years in the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. When more than 100,000 people took to the streets in San Juan, Puerto Rico this summer, demanding the ouster of the governor and other local officials, no it was the direct result of the work of a small team of investigative reporters at Puerto Rico's Center for Investigative Journalism, led by executive director Carla Bennett. We were definitely, we never expected something like this would, have, would happen. We just thought that there were so many things wrong with the governor and his closest advisors and uh, officials that we thought that everybody had to know how they were talking, who they were talking about, and what was the tone that they were using. And it all came in an almost 900-page transcript of an online messaging, a chat it's called, between the governor and his closest associates and advisors. Documents turned over by a confidential source. The governor called one rival a whore. He wrote about another, we must liquidate him today. One of the governor's deputies wrote about a frequent critic of the governor, I am salivating to shoot her. You, you would never expect something like that from a government official about their own political party allies, about the poor people, about women, about LGBT community, um, about everyone. You know, you wouldn't expect that. Just to see it in black and white, it was awful. It must have been amazing to see it right there in front of you. It was. It was. We, we were speechless. Their story came as the people of Puerto Rico were still trying to recover from two devastating hurricanes. And the snide comments from the governor and his cronies, Manette says, proved to be a kind of tipping point in the public outrage. They just, in, in general, they, they talk in a very disrespectful way about the victims. And uh, I think that hurt many people. You know, everybody here in Puerto Rico went through a lot because of the hurricane. A former top aide of the governor wrote about the growing problem with dead bodies, quote, now that we are on the subject, don't we have some cadavers to feed our crows? The demonstrations Within days of the group's publication of the governor's chats, the crowds began to form on the streets of San Juan, leading to some violent confrontations. Tear gas was first deployed by police around 11 p.m., and that sent protesters running. 
At first, Governor Ricardo Rossello said he had no intention of stepping down. There are 100,000 people on the streets, politicians of all stripes, the President of the United States, all saying, you need to go, that this is enough. You've said no. Why not? Well, there's, there's an important uh, component about uh, rule of law and, and democracy, and I respect uh, that process. But the protests continued, fueled by the ongoing reporting of the Center for Investigative Journalism. And then... After hours of delay, Rosselló finally said the words these people had been waiting 12 days to hear. I will be resigning. I have to say I was not surprised. Everybody expected that to happen. We were expecting that to happen because he had no other choice. But when it happened, did you feel like, oh my goodness, we caused this? Well, you know, I don't see it as we caused this. I see it like as the people um, did their part, you know. We do so many stories that never have this kind of outcome. So I think it was, it was the people's doing what happened in the end. The Center for Investigative Journalism and its reporters were applauded across the island and by prominent journalists in New York and Washington. The praise is appreciated, Manette says, but it creates expectations for a lot more. You know, we are very concerned about um, trying to catch up with what people expect from us. You know, we, we are also citizens. We, we have families. We live here. And, um, of course, we are concerned about the outcomes of, of this process. But um, we feel that socially it has been a great lesson for everyone in Puerto Rico and uh, also for other countries and uh, for other states and territories. A lesson about the power of the press? Yeah, definitely. The power of the press and the power of the people. And the power of the people. I like how she told me we're both citizens and journalists. So our shout out tonight to Puerto Rico Center for Investigative Journalism. Keep up the good work down there. That's our program for tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here on the Law and Crime Network next week. Good night.